Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, first, I would like to thank CMES for allowing me to uh, present my uh, defense. I would also like to thank the American Institute for Maghreb Studies, or AIMS, for uh, providing me with a grant to conduct part of my research in Morocco. I'd like to thank my dissertation committee for their patience uh, throughout the process of this pro project. Um, my dissertation is a little lengthy, so what I would like to do is focus on Morocco, which is about two chapters. I will try to summarize it within uh, half an hour. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to um, give a summary of the first two chapters uh, in order for us to understand the um, issue. So the first chapter is basically a background on Islamic jurisprudence on marriage. Um, I explored the opinions of Sunni schools of law, the uh, jurists of Sunni schools, schools of law. Also from the Shia schools of law, I explored the opinions of the 12 Shia, as well as some independent jurists. And I found out that although there are certain consensus within each school of law, there are certain independent jurists that did not agree with these uh, uh, rulings and these minority opinions became important later on, and, and these minority jurists were from the 8th century that are still until today, this is 21st century, and they're important until today, and they're quoted quite a bit within the Islamic law. The second p the chapter is concerning the uh, debates of uh, um, int uh, Arab intellectuals after the codification of the Arab uh, states, when they started, after gaining their independence, Arab states started codifying Islamic family law into what came to be known as the uh, personal status law for each state. When that happened, we started seeing dynamic and vibrant um, uh, debate among intellectuals throughout the Arab states, Moroccan intellectuals, would communicate with Egyptians, Egyptians would communicate with Syrians, Syrians would communicate with Iraqi intellectuals, and so on, so it was across the boundaries. And these uh, uh, personal status laws that were codified, mostly uh, in most states, were based on Islamic jurisprudence, uh, based on the opinions of jurists um, within the Islamic uh, schools of law, the four similar schools of law, the Hanafi, the Shafi'i, the Maliki, and the Hanbalis, and we, from the uh, uh, Shi'is uh, in Lebanon, for example, Iraq, they were based on 12 Shi'i jurists. However, some of them were based on uh, minority uh, opinions, minority uh, jurist opinions. And um, the third and the fourth chapter are basically on debates within Morocco, within Morocco, and I will start with Morocco, um, uh, focusing on two aspects of the marriage contract. The first one is the legal minimum age of marriage, codifying that, and then the role of the marriage guardian or the wali, and specifically the male wali, because that's really what is important and what the contention, the, the point of contention is the male wali, and contracting his female ward, or if the father is the wali or the marriage guardian, then in contracting his daughter in marriage. And by the way, the adult man after the minimum age of marriage is not required to have a male wali within Islamic jurisprudence. Only in some cases, for, it is only required, may be required, and there is certain opinions who don't require that for the woman. So our focus is going to be on the legal age of marriage for women, for women, and also the marriage guardian for women. And my argument is of two folds. First, I argue that the minority opinions of early Muslim jurists, along with the opinions of a few intellectuals, were paramount in influencing reforms among Arab Muslim states that enhance women's rights according to Islamic family law. My second, the second part of my argument is, I argue that conservative intellectual Arab Muslim men 
were ca are capable of producing liberal work and shifting the discussion over gender rights in Islamic fa family law. And I will bring an individual that I met in my uh, trip to Morocco and uh, interviewed who will actually be paramount, and he was paramount, in establishing and in uh, 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 the personal uh, status law in Morocco. He participated in the actual making of the uh, family law in, Mar in Morocco. So um, unlike any other states, uh, Arab states, uh, Moroccan personal law was named, named the Mudawana. And from now on, I'll refer to it as the Mudawana. In 1956, Morocco gained its independence from France, and immediately after that, in 1957, the king of Morocco, back then Mohammed V, commissioned a committee to establish a new personal status law for Morocco. The committee was made of 10 individuals. All of them were men with Experts or their expertise were in Islamic jurisprudence, particularly all the 10 men were experts in Maliki law, and they were all affiliated with one university, which is a conservative, one of the most, or one of the conservative universities in Morocco, which is called Al Qarawiyin University in city of Fez. One of the individuals who was really important for us, or was important at the time, his name was Allal al-Fasi. And Allal al-Fasi was not only a jurist, but he was a politician. He was a leading politician in the independent party, or uh, al-Istiqlal party. He established it. He was prominent in um, um, res the resistance movement as well. Prior to 1957, Alal Fasi, although he was conservative, uh, wrote a book criticizing the customs of Morocco for restic restricting the uh, uh, freedom of women. <clears throat> and proposed, 1949, uh, in 1949, he proposed a minimum age of marriage and uh, 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 wrote against coercion or early marriage. He also proposed that a woman be educated and become independent. However, <clears throat> after investigating um, the role of, Mar of uh, Alal al Fasi in the Mudawana in 1957, Mudawana, he had to give in because the other nine jurists uh, wanted the Mudawana to parallel the Maliki law. Uh, the Maliki law, and therefore, although the Maliki law does not, none of the school of law. Uh, stipulate a minimum, a legal minimum age of marriage, and they go by puberty usually. Um, and they uh, had a minimum, legal minimum age of marriage at the time, 18 for men and 15 for women. Providing the judge with a broad authority to marry minor girls who were less than uh, 15 years old, and according to his discretion. <coughs> In terms of the uh, marriage guardian, they required a marriage guardian for a woman who is below the age of 21. 21 was called the age of competency, legal financial competency. And although the woman is 15 years old, for example, from the woman from 15 years old until 21, she is required a male guardian. Above 21, if she is married without a male guardian, the husband has to be from her same social status, or otherwise, the marriage guardian has the right to dissolve, dissolve the marriage. He has the right to petition the court to dissolve the marriage. Of course, upon, upon the publication of the Mudawana, there was quite a bit of opposition. Intellectual men and women alike opposed what the um, uh, committee came up with, and many of them so that it was an insult to women that a woman uh, uh, needs uh, a marriage guardian at this time, this was the 20th century, where, and instead, and they all asked, why didn't we follow another school of law, which is the Hanafi, and the Hanafi school of law allows a woman huh, 
Abu Hanifa was one among the minority jurors who allowed a woman to contract her marriage without a marriage guardian, without the consent of a marriage guardian, of course, providing that the uh, future husband is of same uh, social uh, status. Um, in 1983, 19, in the mid-80s on, we started having um, NGOs uh, West, uh, funded by the West. And these also uh, cited by many of the uh, women and uh, men who wanted to give uh, Muslim or Moroccan Muslim women uh, broader rights uh, in their marriage and also in their divorce because the divorce was a unilateral right of the man as well as his right for more, uh, marrying more than one woman. Um, so among the individuals that came and sided with Moon as well was um, Ahmad al-Khamlishi. The opposition to the Mudawana and the call for reforms escalated until uh, 1992 when the king then, Hassan II, he approved another committee. And in 1993, another committee was established to make the first reform for the Mudawana. This time, instead of 10, we have 20 men. Uh, 20 men. Among them is an individual that is very important, is Ahmed al Khamlish. And although the uh, women and uh, NGOs expected certain reforms that they called for because uh, King Hassan II listened to them and invited them to his palace, but hardly anything changed from the first Mudawana. Hardly anything changed. One of the changes, just to, to state them, was lowering the age of competency from 21 to 20. So a woman <laughs> still has to have a marriage guardian. Uh, and she still, and the age of marriage, the minimum age of marriage stayed the same. In 1999, and uh, the government, well, actually a minister in the government from the Socialist Party made a proposal. Uh, he proposed uh, uh, what the government later on sponsored, the government's national plan of action, or NPA. And this national plan calls for raising the, minimum, the legal minimum age of marriage for women, eliminating the role of the marriage guardian, restricting polygyny, and restricting the man's unilateral right to divorce uh, his wife and bringing that, the, the, any decision of divorce has to go to the court and the judge has to decide on that. While the NGOs and, women, and, and, and many of the uh, women and, and a few of the men uh, applauded the plan, there was a mounting opposition from Islamist organizations. One of the Islamist organizations championed a rally the Justice and Development Party in 2000 uh, championed a, part, uh, uh, a rally in the city of Casablanca and rounded almost one million individuals against the, any reforms in the 1993 Mudawana calling that any reform is un-Islamic and an assault on Islamic Moroccan society. On the other hand, the NGOs, the funded by the West, and also uh, some, uh, many of the, the intellectuals and many of the activists in Morocco, had another rally in Rabat. And the discussion, and the, there was heated debates uh, in, uh, throughout the media, and the king, then uh, king, the current king, King Mohammed V, ha, uh, the sixth, had to interfere. And in 2001, he announced the, uh, uh, another, uh, uh, the establishment of another committee. This committee was unlike the other two committees. Huh? It was a committee made of 15 individuals, including three women. For the first time, huh? for the first time, actually this is the first time in the history probably of um, uh, uh, Arab Muslim states that we have women that are not jurists. 
uh, a physician, one, uh, one of the women was a physician, another one uh, was a social scientist, and then one who was a professor actually at uh, uh, the School of Law in uh, uh, Rabat. So three of them had no background in uh, Islamic jurisprudence, but they were expert in their fields. Ahmad al-Khamlizi also is expert in secular law aside from uh, Islamic jurisprudence, and he was one of them. And uh, uh, this committee, according to Ahmad al-Khamlishi, has quite a bit of tension, as you might imagine. One of the writers actually described the committee of split into two. Twelve jurists, I mean uh, eleven jurists, with the opposition headed by Ahmad al-Khamlishi heading the women, uh, making a dichotomy uh, there. And Ahmad Khamisi told me in uh, an interview that the majority, when they used to write the draft, they have written some of the drafts over four times. The committee took 28 months to reform the Mudawana. There was so much disagreement among them that the head of committee had to resign, or was actually deposed by the king, and he had to bring a politician in order for them to agree on something. And Ahmad Khamisi said that the opinion of the 11 jurists has to always be in the body of the form or the paper or the draft. His opinion and the opinion of the women were on the margin. Oh. Huh? Talking about marginalizing uh, uh, <laughs> the minority. But it was preserved. Huh? They, they wanted or you know, they insisted on having his, uh, uh, the opinions of al Khamlishi. So what happened then was something uh, that was not uh, familiar to the 11th jurists on many of the Islamists. The minimum age of marriage was raised for women from 15 to 18. The age of competency now became 18 as well. The um, judge now is assisted by legal experts and medical experts. If the judge, one of someone who wanted to marry a woman, man, wanted to marry bef below the age of 18, she had to go through a process of examinations from a physical, from a, a medical expert as well as a social expert. They have to testify and sign along with the woman and her father in front of legal witnesses, two legal witnesses, that she is fit mentally and physically to marry below if she was below the age of 18. The role of the marriage guardian was almost eliminated and left for the woman. The marriage guardian, if the woman wants it, wants the marriage guardian to be to sign, then the marriage guardian may sign. Otherwise, the woman who reached the age of 18 may contract her marriage without, conduct her marriage without the permission of her um, uh, marriage guardian. And in uh, my, inter in, in my uh, visit to uh, Morocco, I had the chance to interview nine intellectuals. I'm going to present a few of them, the opinion of these individuals and their arguments regarding the minimum, legal minimum age of marriage, whether they agree with it, the 18 years old for a woman to, to marry, and whether they agree or disagree with the uh, requirement of the marriage guardian. The individuals I'm going to present, they're all conservative individuals in terms of their uh, upbringing, in terms of their education, and what they teach, uh, except for one, uh, they, they were all professors. The first individual, unfortunately, I misplaced his picture. Uh, I took a picture with him, but I misplaced it. His name is Abdus Salam Vigo, and Abdus Salam Vigo, um, a jurist, a professor, uh, wrote over 20 books on Islamic law as well as on other uh, topics. He um, was one of the individuals who can say, well, this is a conservative individual. When I sat down with him, 
um, he talked about how it was almost the jurists of the past almost huh? although it is not true but he said it's they almost agreed they almost reached consensus on the requirement of the wali and a marriage according to him without a wali is not a valid marriage um, and in terms of the uh, age of marriage and I would like to quote some of what he said he said Islam never assigned a specific age for marriage Islamic Sharia allowed for girls to marry at as young as 12 if they have reached puberty if they have reached puberty um, another thing that he said which you know he is always suspicious and others as well of Western funded um, or, uh, feminist organizations and continuing on the age of marriage he, t he stated while women organizations call for raising the minimum age of marriage claiming that early marriage harms women my own illiterate mother married young and gave birth to several children through her sacrifice and hard work all of her children were educated my mother represents most of the Moroccan women who were married young what type of harm did, my, did early marriage bring to those women like my own mother the illiterate woman my mother who married young and produced several children who went on to become medical doctors and successful individuals has suffered no harm my mother suffered nothing due to early marriage however women organizations have always exaggerated the claims fearing that young women may harm may be harmed and may not be able to raise one or two children increasing the minimum age of marriage is not the right answer to solve many of Moroccan society's issues to him he said, went on to say in many cases early marriage is the right solution for a Muslim country like ours where people marry at a young age to avoid vice and immoral issues he also claimed that delaying marriage is the problem where men and women who marry late oftentimes fall into immoral acts and commit sins straight uh, uh, conservative opinion He's also a Sufi, by the way. He is also a Sufi. The second one is uh, Fatima Buslema and Buslema, and Fatima Buslema is a professor at the same um, university and, uh, that Ahmed Al Khamlishi, who will meet later on, she te teaches Islamic family law, a trained jurist, and um, an individual at the time when I met her she headed a conference and there was at least 30 individuals from faculty and staff who were under her uh, authority uh, during the three-day conference when i asked her about the she the age the uh, um, age of marriage and whether she agrees with the mudawana of the marriage of 18 she gave me uh, 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 an answer which had tied the islam uh, muslim jurists from the past to the present what she said when early jurists past jurists authorized early marriage they did this according to customs and traditions of the time today we are in need of rulings which are which reflect our customs and practices of the Moroccan Muslim society in the 21st century we need new ijtihad we need new ijtihad to help produce appropriate laws which are different from the laws that were carved centuries ago. We are in need of jurists who are in touch with our society's needs, since Quran and Sunnah did not elaborate on every single issue in society. However, Muslima is of the opinion that a marriage guardian is required for a woman to conduct her marriage. She stated to me several reasons, and I'll bring some of them. She says that the, the guardianship brings the woman honor and respect as the groom and his family will recognize in the wali that the woman has someone to protect and look after her second a new marriage brings with it a new relationship between two families the objective of the wali's investigation who usually investigates the groom or the potential husband of the potential groom is to ensure that the two families are suitable for this new relationship according to Moroccan Islamic customs 
and I, I, I learned that when I was there actually, that the father, forgot about it since living here, that the father has always been the financial supporter for a wife after her divorce. And at that, and, and that it is inconceivable for a woman who was raised and cared for by her father to marry without his permission. So to her, it's a sign of respect to have the father particularly um, be the marriage guardian. And the guardianship is a matter of uh, custom. It's a matter of protection from uh, falling into uh, the wrong hands. The second individual is uh, a physician uh, by training, Dr. Asma Limrab, and she heads one of the most conservative Islamist organizations in uh, Morocco called Al Muhammadiyya Party. Her opinions are completely different than the other two. She is for the raising the minimum age of marriage to 18. And she told me that she feels a woman today should be independent and should not require a man to conduct her marriage. Uh, that she needs no man to do any work for her or on her behalf. She, uh, uh, by the way, she's very popular with the French media. She published a couple of books, but she's very, she always travels to France and um, uh, does interviews uh, on the TV. The third individual is Raja uh, Al-Naji, and Raja Al-Naji is one of the most um, intelligent individuals that I've ever seen. Well-grounded in Islamic jurisprudence. She's a professor of law at uh, Muhammad the Sixth or Muhammad V uh, uh, College of Law in uh, Rabat. She just authored a book on the permissibility that is permissible for a Muslim to donate his or her body to science or medicine after death. And she announced in the book that she has made the decision and donated her body for science after her death. Um, one of the things that she's done in 2008, she was actually chosen by the king to deliver the sermon in the month of Ramadan in the king's palace. This was um, uh, a position always uh, reserved for men to deliver the uh, sermon. And she delivered the sermon, and there was quite a bit of, uh, um, let's say, personal attack against her uh, that this was not a Muslim custom or, a custom or tradition, particularly in Morocco, that a woman uh, uh, does that, especially in the king's uh, uh, presence. And when she did that, when she delivered, she had to sit on the king's throne. And the king and the other jurists, all men jurists, sat on the floor. That's why they call her the woman who sat on the throne and seated the king on the floor. Uh, in, terms of the marriage, in terms of the marriage guardian, she is for the marriage guardian. And she stated to me that it is our custom. And the NGO's work, Western NGO's work, is an assault on our identity, our Moroccan identity. And this is our society, and we want, uh, Allah, we want to have a male guardian according to our customs. But when it came to the minimum age of marriage, she said, I am with the minimum age of marriage and will not uh, uh, go below the uh, minimum age of marriage. And the reason she uh, is stipulating that, she said that this is the least a minimum, uh, the least a, a woman or the least education that a woman may obtain is the high school and the high school finishes at the age of 18. Our um, fourth individual, which is uh, Ahmed Al-Khamlishi, and Ahmed Al-Khamlishi is, he was born in 1928. He's 86 years old now. I had at least three interviews with him um, due to the, uh, let's call it, the radical opinions that he had um, and the, more, the, the interesting discussion uh, we had uh, between us. He was... Um, born within a traditional conservative family. His father was a Sufi. 
he uh, memorized the Quran at the age of 10. Went on to religious school, uh, obtaining his undergrad and um, graduate degrees in Islamic jurisprudence and obtained a, a degree in law. He uh, was a judge at first and then later on uh, taught Islamic uh, family law um, until he, he was uh, appointed the head of Dar al-Hadith al husayniya It's an institu uh, a conservative institution only for graduate students and it teaches Islamic jurisprudence. Um, Ahmad al-Khamlishi, when I asked him about um, whether Islamic law or Islamic jurisprudence can be reformed and what rulings can be reformed. And his answer was, any legal transaction, whether Muslim jurists have reached consensus on the issue or not, can be revisited, challenged, and can be reformed. And can be reformed. He said, in terms of the uh, uh, transactions, they are open. In terms of the consensus of the jurists, of the past jurists, and I'd like to quote what him uh, uh, in this. Ahmad al uh, was critical of the consensus of the past jurists as a source of law. This consensus, according to him, while started in the 8th century, could not be generalized as a source of law to all Muslims living throughout the world in different centuries. Rulings which were the outcome of ijma' may not be considered for Muslims living in Spain or Africa or the Middle East. Even if some of the ulama have agreed on certain rulings, these rulings are considered their own opinions and are open for reforms and changes. The consensus, according to al khamishi must be restrict restricted by place and time. By place and time. And what he said that if we, for example, reach consensus in Morocco, Algeria should not have these consensus as well. They should have their own consensus. But what he said that the consensus are, that are understood through Islamic jurisprudence books is a dangerous method to uphold. <coughs> Why? Because consensus is an authoritarian method to him, founded in order to monopolize fiqh by male jurist, or Islamic jurisprudence by male jurist. Through the method of consensus, jurists aimed at closing the gate to anyone attempting to challenge their authority. That was his, his uh, opinion. In terms of ijtihad and the method of ijtihad, al khamlizi was against individual ijtihad. Against individual ijtihad. And instead he advocated a new type of ijtihad. He called it the collective ijtihad or al ijtihad al jamai instead of the individual ijtihad. To him, this ijtihad is practiced by men and women who are jurists or professionals, uh, experts in law, science, and by intellectuals who represent civil society. So it's no longer the jurists that may practice is the ijtihad. Uh, reforming the Madawana according to him should not be limited to jurists, but should be also but should also include other experts in law and social issues. So a mujtahid, could a mujtahid be, when I asked him, could a mujtahid be, you know, a woman could be, and he said yes. And actually after that I met with Raja Naji that we met a few uh, minutes ago, and I asked her if she considers herself a mujtahid, and she said yes. She said yes. She, uh, uh, <coughs> so what is the role of a faqih, a jurist now, I asked. After, you know, that's after observing this in one day. The next day, I went back and I asked him, well, then what is the role of a jurist? Because a jurist, to us, is one who is experts in Islamic jurisprudence and may issue le uh, decrees, or a mufti, uh, that can issue uh, fatwas, non-binding, but they're still followed. <clears throat> and particularly in the age of marriage, what he said, he asked me, what qualifies a jurist to make a ruling regarding the age of marriage? A jurist's opinion is only his 
opinion and must not be considered a law. The jurist is nothing but a spiritual advisor. Wa'ad in Arabic. And he's not a lawmaker. His opinion is one among many, but never a law. But never a law. Al Khamlisi's influence went beyond um, his students. NGOs quoted him, cited him, copied his methodology. And when I visited some of the NGOs, they were happy, of course, to give me their brochures and their books. And I'm looking, and after reading them, I realized that, first of all, they are including Islamic jurisprudence. This is a French-funded NGO. And you look at it, and you see opinions similar to Al-Khamri, the methodology. Argument for uh, the raising the minimum age of marriage. The argument against uh, uh, a marriage guardian are all there, huh? stipulated just as if I'm reading something from al khamlishi or other books uh, uh, of intellectuals. His influence was profound in Islamic family law or on the Mudawana. I counted over 22 articles from the Mudawana, the 2004 Mudawana, that were actually either inspired or the work of Ahmad al khamlishi uh, his idea or his fight, and, and, and he was honored, by the way, for these accomplishments by other intellectuals in two universities in Morocco, and for his hard work in uh, reforming the uh, uh, Moroccan Mudawana. Increasing, he fought for increasing the minimum age of marriage to 18 for both men and women, eliminating, almost eliminating our requirements of the marriage guardian. Now, uh, prior to the 2004, um, Budawana, a woman does not have to appear in court to be married. The marriage guardian will have her sign the contract at home, for example, and brings it to witnesses. Al Khamlishi insisted that the woman signs that in present of the two witnesses in, uh, in, uh, at court. Um, he fought for the restriction of women's uh, unilateral right to divorce and restricted the polygamy. Now, if a man ha wants to marry another woman, the f the, the, his current woman has to go to court, sign that she is accepting the new wife, which is, of course, uh, nobody wants to do that anyway. <laughs> and divorce has to be in court. Uh, a man has no uh, 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 authority to do uh, unilateral uh, divorce. The family judge now is assisted by legal experts, no longer has the sole opinion on deciding on the minority, uh, in, uh, on a minor's uh, marriage. Also, he is provided with help in terms of uh, overseeing divorce cases, alimony, and child support. For the first time, Ahmad al-Khamlishi had to fight, and he told me that the word, the term DNA in English, they fought, fought bitterly over the term, and they had to translate it into Arabic to write it down in the Mudawana, but they admitted that. Now, they admitted the evidence now. If anyone, uh, if there is a question in paternity, the court may order a DNA test. And also, if anyone breaks any of the articles of the Mudawana, this individual could be brought to justice and uh, having criminal, uh, criminal consequences uh, for that. Undocumented marriages, there is, this is my last thing, and there is a custom in Morocco in remote areas where minors are married verbally, huh? in a verbal ceremony with, uh, uh, this is unique to Morocco, I believe, there has to be 12 witnesses to the marriage. And it's prevalent in remote areas because of uh, the lack of uh, um, schools, lack of services, poverty, and unemployment. And what al Khamisi proposed, and this actually is happening right now, to for these marriages to be given certain time to be documented. But no one may marry after a certain time. The time expired in February, but they had to extend it because of the uh, numbers of marriages that were coming to them. So from this, I hope that I made things clearer in terms of an intellectual like al Khamlishi, who had a profound impact on Islamic family law and also that uh, conservative intellectual Arab Muslims like him, unlike Al-Lal al-Fasi as well, were capable of producing liberal work and shifting the discussion 
over gender rights in Islamic family law. And the last thing that I wanted to emphasize that it would be difficult to make a dichotomy that we have a liberal intellectual, for example, and a conservative intellectual because we've seen that conservative or what we perceive to be conservative may produce, may have different opinions and not all conservatives have the same um, uh, type of work. And thank you very much for uh, being here.